Zandon's poetry in motion, big horse but light on his feet, and he's always showed up and been consistent and been right there with some of the top horses in training. In the Bluegrass Stakes, he showed his determination and his raw ability. It's over! Zandon wins the Toyota Bluegrass! I feel breeders will be really blown away by what a striking, outstanding looking horse he is. Register now for the 2024 Pass the Wire Kentucky Derby Seminar. In-depth analysis of every horse, contenders, pretenders, live long shots, and more. The Kentucky Derby Seminar on PassTheWire.com. Reserve your seat today. Remember, nobody does it better. Thank you for visiting Pass the Wire TV, the YouTube channel of PassTheWire.com. Everybody. Welcome to Pass the Wire TV. Fortunate enough today to be joined by John Stewart of Resolute Racing. John, w welcome to Pass the Wire TV and thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, let, let's start with this. For those, those who don't know, um, how did you, I know, I know you're from Lexington originally, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, horse country, but tell everybody how you got into horse racing and, uh, you know, what, what, what drew you to the sport? You know, I got into racing like uh, most people. I got in as a fan of racing, uh, just attending the races at Keeneland and Lexington at the Kentucky Derby. And, uh, you know, just looking forward to that every spring and fall, uh, you know, going out to the races with friends and family and, and seeing the horses and just being a part of all the excitement uh, that's around it. And so uh, that's how I kind of started as just a fan of the sport. Now, Go, go, going back then, did you ever at that point envision yourself being a, a, a prominent figure and owner in racing and, you know, really no, no, coming no, in I, like I, you have? Yeah, not, not at all. And, and, uh, um, and probably even if you had asked me that a couple of years ago, I would have said the same thing. Um, you know, um, never, never really uh, kind of thought of that as some, a path where I'd end up. Okay. And. Take me through it. How how did you decide to get in, and how did you decide to get in on the level that you have um, a, a, a mist in envi environment that has a, a lot of negativity to the sport? Now, there'd be a lot of people that would say, hey, this is not the sport and not the time to get into it. Personally, I disagree with that, but there is a lot of that out there. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because it just seems like Hmm, interesting time for somebody to come in at that level when the sport's working out so many different issues. Yeah. So, well, um, so it started a couple of years ago. I, uh, I met, uh, Gavin O'Connor, who's the general manager for our farm now, uh, through a mutual friend. And we bought, uh, I bought my first horse at the Keeneland September sale in 2022. Uh, it was a yearling. She's a three-year-old now Shiloh's mistress that's running. And, um, you know, just as like something to kind of like have some fun or that, that, that kind of thing. And then um, this year, as we were preparing for the Keeneland sale, you know, we, we had, um, I, I, I told him I wanted to get a little bit more involved in what was going on. I had heard a lot of the, uh, you know, negative things that have been said about the industry. I started to do some research, try to understand like some of the problems that are going on, the decline in the foal population and, and uh, because I'm here from Lexington, you know, I've seen the sport, in my opinion, get like less relevant, you know, over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. And then as I started to, you know, you know, get more information on like uh, what's been going on uh, with the sport, um, you know, fe felt like, you know, I had been very fortunate uh, in my career uh, and, uh, you know, lived in this area and, uh, you know, had, had some ideas about maybe uh, getting more involved. And, um, and my way of getting involved is just um, is to jump right in and, and um, you know, don't, not talk about the problems, but just start working to fix the problems. And so one of the problems that I wanted to get into fix right away was uh, the fact that a lot of the bloodstock has been leaving uh, the country. And, um, you know, if you look at the bloodlines, they're just not as thick as they were you know, back 30, 40 years ago. And there's a lot of, you know, 
I would call it overbreeding of like some of the stallions. Um, and, you know, I understand the model and I'm not, and I'm not downing the model at all. Um, but I just think that like, there's some of the stallions that uh, as they're trying to make stallions, they're breeding the insufficient mares and it's making stock that, you know, on one side looks really good. And on the other side, there's just nothing there. And right. so those insignificant mares. And then when you look at like the, the amount of significant mares that have been leaving the country and going, I mean, we've, the, you know, basically the restart of the, you know, the Irish industry came from Kentucky. Basically the start of the Japanese in, industry started from, you know, and so all of these places have like uh, really depleted the bloodstock here. And then we've created all this competitiveness in the market to buy the bloodstock. And, and so we're seeing like the same groups end up being the highest buyers and bidders in these auctions all around the world and taking all the bloodstock back to, you know, different uh, places, which aren't Kentucky or are not the United States. And so I, I really wanted to uh, uh, develop a program that was around racing and breeding, breeding to race, and, but also at the top end of the bloodlines and the top end of the on the track performance uh, focused around fillies and mares. You know, you, you said something and, and, and I've heard you say this before, and it's 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 really one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, because, you, you know, you use the term breed to race. OK, and, and, and I love that term and I'll tell you why I go back in this game a long way and and I try and trace where the change in everything you described and the dynamic that you described really started happening. And I'm like, when, 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 when did it change? And I remember as a kid going to the races and going up to Saratoga every year, like in the 70s, there were a lot of the maiden special weight races at Saratoga and, you know, even at Keeneland that featured homebreds. Yeah. You know, farms bred their horses. And I don't care how big your checkbook was. You couldn't go into the fifth stable back then and buy any of those horses. You yeah. know what I mean? Didn't matter how much. They weren't for sale. Buckland Farm, uh, Christiana Stable, or, um, Calumet back in the day when they were red. Yeah. With, with, with the, you couldn't buy that. They weren't for sale. They bred to race. They were competitive. And they wanted to beat each other. They didn't want to go partners. They didn't want to, um, you know, have other people in and and. I believe that the tax laws changing kind of began to drive some of those farms out of the game. And to me, and I'm curious of your take, that may have started the ball rolling away from the breed to race and more towards the breed to sell and commercial um, model that we have today that I, I believe is partly responsible for diluting the breed and creating the environment you discussed. Can you talk a little bit about that? And if you agree, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with you. You know, so one of the things I do whenever I uh, invest in anything, so I'm an investor by nature. I, uh, you know, own a private equity firm that invests in industrial companies. And so before I make an investment, especially in something I'm not familiar with, I'll do a lot of research. And, you know, so I started back with how did the sport even, you know, start in Kentucky and, you know, how are in the United States, you know, because it didn't start in, United, in Kentucky, it started in the north and then moved down to the south. And so as, as you start to look at like what has happened and, you know, there, there's a lot of factors. And I think, you know, that's a good factor that you bring up. I think another factor is um, because of the, um, the, the difficulties uh, that it is with the with the farms just to make it uh, on their own because the prize purses are not enough to sustain the farm. So they have to sell stock in order to be able to, so you got these multi-generational farms and the model that their, you know, great, great grandfather had doesn't really work because the, um, the, the prize pools, if you look at the prize pools kind of in relation to where they, you know, are now versus where they were, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, versus what the cost to raise the horse were, you know, I, I think that that's dramatically changed. And you're just not seeing the price purses increase. Uh, and, and they should, there's no reason that they shouldn't, uh, even with the demand that's around racing today, you know, um, you know, for gambling, gambling needs racing to exist, right? Because there's no other sport on the planet that runs 364 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all around the world. And so, you know, basketball's got a season, baseball's got a season, soccer's got a season, all these things have seasons. So, you know, the, uh, I, you know, I, there's a lot of people taking 
from the industry. They just take, 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 right? And you can't be a taker. Like no, no industry can just have takers, right? There has to be, you have to, you have to be able to invest back in the industry. And so, you know, I, I came, I'm coming in at a really high level of the sport and like buying the best, uh, you know, quality, you know, and already, you know, we, we've, we've done some research. We have our own strategy for how we're evaluating on the track horses. We have our own strategy for how we're, you know, reviewing blood stock. And it's based on, you know, some of the systems that other people use, but it's pretty differentiated. And, you know, arguably it's working. I mean, every horse I have running today is in graded stakes races. That's, no. that's an impressive statistic. I mean, there, there, there's no way around it. Let me ask you this, John. Any concern uh, about coming into the game at such a high level and lasting, you know, sustainability? I mean, somebody comes to me. I'm salute. I, I, I like that kind of confidence. But what no. comes to mind, and I forget the gentleman's name, but if, you probably know it, Conquest. They used to name all their horses Conquest something. That that gentleman came in, made a big splash, had a lot of horses, uh, was running in a lot of stake races, and for whatever reason, did, didn't last. There's no more of those Conquest horses around. So no concern of that at all. Yeah, yeah. so so it, it, I think it, it goes to what your goals are, right? Okay. You know, um, you know, famously when Sheikh Mohammed entered the market, you know, he wanted to win the prestigious races, right? And spent probably more money than anybody has, right? And and they've they've developed a very good program, you know, absolutely. You know, they've but done he, they've he done can't buy he can't buy the derby yet. You can't you can't buy it, even though right. the only horse that I bought this year that was derby eligible is in the derby. So I don't know. Right. I might be doing something right, even though a lot of people on social media don't want to give me any credit because I've not been in the sport that long. But you know, and, and I think that is I think that's an insult to all the fans. Because right. just because we were on the other side of the rail doesn't mean we don't know what's going on. Right. And so for some of the people that are like slamming me on Twitter and stuff and saying, well, you've only been in it this long or whatever, you know what? I've been along this, around the sport a long time, you know? And so I, and I'm trying to approach it. I think a way a lot of people would, if they had my resources and they had the capability to do so. And so, you know, um, but my, my goal in this is not to win the races. That's not my goal. My goal in this is not to make myself a lot of money. You know, I want it to be a profitable enterprise. I think any business, in order for it to survive, it has to be profitable on right. its own. My goal in this is to try to advance the sport. It's to be a good sportsman. I want to be a good sportsman, number one. Like, that's the number one thing that I want. I want to make sure that everybody that I work with and my team, that we're doing everything the right way. And I'll be honest with you, there's some big, there's some problems that are making the, the, um, uh, headlines, but those are those are the results of other problems. I'll be honest, the, one of the biggest problems that I've seen that I've just been like flabbergasted. So I've been paying some big money for some horses, right? And, um, you know, I, I buy these horses and then I send them off to some of these tracks to be trained. And the facilities that those horses live in unbelievable. are unbelievable. No paddocks. Right. I know. 23 and 24 hours in a stall. No, no. I thought with horse racing, what these horses, like these horses for the Derby, you know, these, these horses that are, you know, potentially going to be stallions right down the line and be worth tens of millions of dollars. I thought that like, when I walked in, I thought that like the food would be like tested and the nutritional value of the food would be like in a package and it would be like certified that this is for thoroughbred horse race. I mean, you would think with the technology we have today that, you know, those types of things would exist, that the water that they were drinking would be tested, make sure there's no contaminants, would be filtered, you know, and all of these different, like you know, the technology would be there. And, you know, you, you see all this stuff now where people saying, well, there's trace elements and there's all that kind of stuff. Well, you know what? We've been able to test for that stuff for years, right? right. And it, and and that that we should already be doing that. We should be testing the supply chain and the food and the and the nourishment that our animals are getting and making sure and they're getting what 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 the intended nourishment is instead of just buying hay from random vendors or buying feed from you know X Y Z vendor and you know and I'm not I'm not like I'm not slamming anybody. I'm just saying that 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 is a fixable problem. And so from like my like I'm not trying to tell everybody what they have to do. But for my horses, I'm going to fix that problem. I'm going to address that. I'm going to address that issue. I'm going to make sure because, you know, when, when you start to look at like performance, um, I could breed perfectly. 
and have like everything perfect by genetics. Then there's so much variability that's introduced through the nutritional factors, the environment, the, the, the medical care that the horses receive the type of ground that they try, all these things. And so you got to try to start reducing those variables to get more consistent performance. And so we got to do a better job of collecting data. And so I'm already starting to collect, you know, a lot of this data. And I can tell you, cause I just started a farm and I got this real experienced farm staff. The, the number one thing that the industry has got to get past is I'll ask a question and I'll say, Hey, why don't we try this? And they said, no, we can't do that. Cause everybody else does it this way. And so I told my team, I said, guys, if you want to run our farm and you want to do things the way everybody else does things, let's sell it all right now because I have no desire to do that. Right. We're, we're going to we, we need to address these issues. We need to find ways to address the issues that everybody else, you know, is is, you know, just accepts as a part of the status quo. Right. Um, you know, I, I was meeting with my trainers, you know, to talk, uh, the trainers have been training our yearlings before they go to trainers for two-year-olds. And so we're talking and, you know, they're using all this terminology that's new to me. And so like I ask a question, you know, they're saying, well, this horse needs like 30 more days. He has hot knees. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? And they're like, well, when you put your hand on their knees, you they're sensitive and they're warm to the touch. And I'm like, but what's going on inside his knees, right? And so there's there, of course, there's technology, you know, cat scans, different things that we can be using to, you know, look at what's going on inside these horses. And, you know, it's just like breakdowns, you know, people are like, well, those, those happen with horses. Okay. Well, if we're collecting the data, you know, like if we're, if we're like scanning horses before they do anything like harder than a gallop. And then when they do, and the, so for example, they're doing breezing, we scan them before breezing, we scan them after breezing, we scan them before they go into a race, we scan them after. And we use the technologies out there to try to identify like what are some of the factors that are causing, that's how you solve the problem. You're never gonna solve the problem if you don't start gathering the data. And so, you know, I, you know that's the way I kind of approach my companies. I buy industrial companies and we're always, you know, trying to solve problems and, and those types of things. So to me, the problems aren't that huge in the industry. It's just we got the and the technology available is just like amazing. Like there's so much amazing technology out there that we can be utilizing in the sport. Uh, and but but there's a lot of people that are just like, oh, well, we've always done it that way, you know. And uh, and so I think that's why when you look at like the performance curve, you see that really from the 1940s to today, we have really haven't like made a lot of progress with if you just look at speed, for example, as like a factor there's not like record speeds being set like there were in the thirties and the forties that you saw, you weren't seeing horses that were out running people by 10 or 15 lengths in major races really because everybody started following a uniform system and how they're breeding and training and everything horses. And now there's just a tight band and it's kind of leveled off. No one's who's, who's really looking to try to make that next step and, you know, just not accepting the status quo. And so I think as a newcomer, you know, it gives me, you know, that kind of, you know, um, um, mental challenge of, you know, kind of questioning things. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to down anything. I'm just questioning like, well, you know, like the simple things like, you know, what's a hot knee, you know, what does this mean? What does that mean? And try to try to understand more about what it is and then, you know, try to gather data and, and solve the problems ultimately. And there's, not, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, you, you, you know, you got to realize that, you, you know, you're coming into an industry. All right. That when you really look at it, I mean, even, you know, you mentioned some, you know, lack of a better term, low hanging fruit. We're an industry that on Saturday afternoon, we could have two stake races going off at two different racetracks. And we can't seem to stagger the post times so that the betters and the fans can watch them both. You know what I mean? Yeah. You got to decide to watch one or the other. Because oh, I, have both, the, I have the problem this weekend. Yeah, so I've both got a, I've tracks got a, are trying to I've lug, got, lug the got, gate got, at the same time. Yeah, I got Diddy running in the Ginny Wiley in Lexington. And right. I got Misty Bell running in the Apple Blossom at right. Oakland. Both grade one races. And they'll right. manage to go in the gate at the same time or yeah. 10 seconds into the other race, which to me just – it's mind boggling. I mean, how do yeah. how do we not fix that so people can watch two premier races well, back to back? It, it, so it's it's because the sport's not being managed as an entertainment. The right. entertainment part of the sport is not being managed well, right? And well, I think that's part of it. I also think that you know it's 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 kind of been 
with the racetracks, John, every man for himself. You know what I mean? Oklahoma's not worried about what's happening at Keeneland. Who's not worried yeah. about what's happening at Aqueduct? Who could care less at what's happening at Santa Anita? Everybody's like worried about, you know, their own product. And let's hope they watch our, our, our race. Um, you know, baseball, the small market teams could not survive without revenue sharing. You know, yeah, I mean? exactly. No, right. that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, uh, but it's not, that's an inner there. That, that's where the sports have evolved to manage as entertainment. Right. Right. You know, they, they know that there's a, only a certain amount of audience. Right. Yeah. And they got to share it. The NFL is the same way. Right. You know, or right. why don't they play all the playoff games on the same day? Why do they stagger them on the weekends so that you watch right. them on multiple days? Right. right? So, Makes the, sense. but, but, but that, that part of it has to be managed. But, if you look at who 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 owns the media rights, you know, for racing, you know, it's not the owners of horses, right? No. You know, and, right. and this is the only sport that I'm aware of where the actual athletes get no payment from the media rights. I mean, any, even the NCAA now, the, the kids are being able to tap into that. You know, there's there's no pay going to the jockeys, to the trainers, you know, any of that, because we're the media rights and all the other sports are like going through the roof. And right. you're not seeing prize pools really go up, you know, and that's a way that everybody kind of shares in it. And so, but, I, you know, I think there's some better management around the media rights, but, you know, you can get bogged down by like all the issues. And so I'm just like, I'm, I'm trying to like, you know, I got a very methodical process. I'm trying to look very insular at like what we're doing at Resolute Racing and, and like, and because I can control hundred percent of that. Right. right. And then I want to engage in some of the other issues, like, you know, aftercare is a problem. So, you know, right. I'm, I'm, I'm I know you're having a poker tournament. Yeah, they're going to raise $200,000 for uh, 20 different aftercare organizations. Uh, and, um, you know, I've already got a lot of the uh, other, uh, you know, uh, farms and uh, racing teams, you know, uh, signing up to be a part of it this year. Hopefully I can be an annual thing. You know, I'm just a guy that when there's a problem, let's just take action. And like, you know, we just decided to do the poker tournament this last week and everybody's like scrambling. And I'm like, guys, I got I got poker tables that I play with my friends. I said, we'll take those over there. We'll limit it to 40 people. We'll charge five thousand dollars a head. You know, we'll raise the 200 grand and, you know, we'll, and then we'll we can pivot next year. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, right. so let's get in a, a conference get room get you know, at a hotel started. and, you yeah. know, and just do something. And that's well, that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a, like a person that just wants to let's just do it. Let's just try well, you, something. You, you jumped into the deep end of the pool. I don't think anybody could argue that. But you said something earlier that I, I find interesting. There's a lot of talk in the industry about we need you know, there, you, you hit on this two two groups put money into the game. Everybody else takes out betters and owners are putting money into the game. Everybody else is taking money out of the game and putting no money in. Uh, not the best business model, but that that's that that's that's where we are. But you 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 mentioned something that, you know, people are coming at you on social media, probably in person because you're new to the game, and you know what what do you know or whatever. I, I I try and filter all that negative noise out, and I don't see a lot of it. But I did see one thing that we'll touch on. But as a new owner, wouldn't you think when we talk about we've got to bring owners into the game? We've got to make the game more attractive. We need more owners. We need more horses. Here you got a guy comes in spending money. You know what I mean? You will talk about, you know, the, the, the Winx Philly or whatever that you went to, to nine, nine million on. Um, she went for 10, but spending that kind of money, the game should be the sport and everybody in it should be embracing you and encouraging you and welcoming you and saying, you know, Hey, you know, we, we, oh, I, I feel I, I feel by and large they are. OK, like, good. Yeah, yeah, I feel very welcomed, you know, uh, you know, as a person on the other side of the rail, I always kind of thought like maybe the horse owners were a little stuffy, you know. Right. They, they kind of like were their own. No, it's not been that way here in Lexington. I've been very accepted, you know, by uh, the community. Uh, I've been accepted, you know, where whether I've been in Santa Anita, you know, Breeders Cup or whether I've been to Pegasus or. You know, right. wherever I've been, I, I've seen a lot of acceptance and a lot of people thankful, a lot of people coming up saying it's good for the game for me, you know, being in it and bringing right. new ideas. And, you know, so I think I think that's good. Australia, very accepting down there, you know, which which gave uh, us some motivation for, you know, uh, buying some horses down there and getting in the game because it's really exciting atmosphere there. And, you know, who doesn't want to compete at the end of the day? Right. It's just it's right. fun to compete, you know, and, you know, me and Rapoli on, on, on Twitter. 
you know, that, that that's just good fun. I don't think he thinks anything of it other than I do either. Like we're both pretty accomplished people. And, you know, like, uh, you know, like no one's, we're not trolling each other online. No, I saw that. I didn't, I didn't take it that way at all. No, it's good at for at the all. game. And there's people that are coming back and being like, oh, you want him out of the sport? I'm like, no, he, he, did you read his comment? He's not taking this serious and I ain't either. So, right. you know, it's just like, it, and I think it's good to have some of that healthy banter going into the derby. It, it, and it our is. horses and, are going to be heads up. And, uh, I'll poke a little at that because I think I think one thing I think he was off base on, and I think you even agreed with him. He he likened himself to Tom Brady. Based yeah. on his right. I say no, 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 no. Yeah. Tom Brady would be one of the horses. Okay. Yeah, if exactly. I'm liking you to anybody, I'm going to say Jerry Jones or an owner of the team. You're an owner. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, I'm not going to say you know you're you're not the Tom Brady of the game. You know that's. You know, maybe Uncle Mo. Well, he, Uncle Mo didn't get to show that, but you know, you, you know, uh, a, a horse you can liken to that. You know, I, I don't. Yeah, know. Yeah, no. For for us, like you know, like you know, Good Night Olive and you know, pizza. That's why I'm trying to. If you see, I'm trying to give access to people. Right. Right. Because I'll be honest, when I when when I first went to Keeneland and I bought horses, yeah, I got surrounded after I bought the horses and all these people, you know, from the press, like, why are you buying this horse? And I'm like, why is it in your damn business? Why buying the horse? Right. You know. I didn't realize like how much like interest there was. And then people like, you know, they're really interested in good night olive. And so we actually took her out. We got, you know, Keeneland to take her out on Saturday morning. So the fans right. could see her because they didn't really get to say goodbye to her, you know, cause we thought we were going to race her this year. And, right. you know, we get all kinds of inquiries about the horses. So I'm trying to make the, the, the sports side of it. it's all about the athletes. It's about the horses. It's about the team around them that are taking care of them. And, you know, there's people that will say, oh, well, we, it's abuse of the animals. You know, on my farm, I'll tell you that, like, the 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 grooms that get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, the people, I mean, what, we have people 24-7 that are with the horses. They're never by themselves. These Sorry. people love the animals, right? They, they love these horses, and they care about these horses. So I'm trying to make that visible. You know, I did a couple live streaming things. Pizza Bianca live streamed her full delivery, and everybody was begging me to wait until the horse stood up you know, on its own. And so 48 minute live stream, you know, and, but I want to give those, I want to give people access to that. I think given access and being transparent is good for the sport because there is a lot of mystery, right? Like something bad happens and everybody just doesn't talk about it, you right. know, and I just want to clam up about, it. no, I think we need to talk about things and everything isn't perfect. You know, if you go back to like NASCAR and, and F1 racing, it, there was a day when like people died in the sport. Absolutely. Right? And right. then, and then through safety regulations and 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 the teams coming together and putting in safety protocols now even like they'll have vicious accidents and people walk away from them and That's so true. you know it's the same kind of like transition that we need we need to like face the problems head on we need to all work together to solve them we need to save the competition for the track and you know smack talk is good i think it's good for the sport you know the you know, who, who everybody likes that when you know, the NFL, you know, and the teams are talking, oh, uh, you know, the wide receivers talking to the defensive back and telling him how he's going to burn him, you know. But, you know, when it gets on the track, the it's all going to be answered there. Right. You know? Yeah, no, I, I talked about I, – I did a show once a year or two ago. I forget who it was with where I talked about – we should do more miking up, miking up jockeys during races, miking up, you know, trainers, you, you, you know, and jockeys in the paddock talking and whatnot. It, exactly. It, it got poo pooed, but I thought I think it's a really good idea, and we should do it, do, do more of it. But I want to ask something else because you do a lot of research, you've got a business plan, you know, uh, you know, you're not a guy that just came in and started throwing money, you know, uneducated. There are a lot of people, and and historically there would be a lot of statistics that would back this up that would say. You know, the great race mares don't necessarily translate to great producers yeah. when, when you breed them. Um, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about your take on that, because Pizza Bianca, Goodnight Olive, or ex especially Goodnight Olive was a champion, champion race mare. Yeah. Um, she, she was one of, I, I didn't, not last year, the year before at, at Keeneland, I didn't think she could lose that Breeders' Cup, you, you know, this staff, no matter what. Yeah. Uh, uh, it was one of my biggest Bets. I love to bet. One of my biggest bets that you know I made in in, in in a long time. I think I'm partly responsible for her going off nine to five because Echo Zulo should have been the favorite. I thought, but anyway, yeah. That aside, um, what do you say towards that? You, you, you know, statistic or, or or opinion that the great race mares don't necessarily make the great producers. 
look, I think I think there's validity to that. There's some really good um, uh, mayors that have never run that produce well, right? I right. think there's a lot. I think there's a lot of factors, right? Okay. It depends. You know, it depends on the breeding, uh, who they're bred to. Uh, you know, I think. Uh, you know, so there's a, there, it's a lot more involved than that. I think the the genetics of you know trying to understand. You know, interestingly enough, one of the things that we are looking at is we're looking at like the the um, the number of races and the types of works that the horses are doing over their career. And then we're looking for what the impact that has on their eventual breeding. You know, there's some statistics and stuff that we're gathering. So I'm a I'm a data guy. So I'm you know, I like to see all the data. There, there's a lot of anecdotal information out there. You know, but, you know, when you start to look at the data, there's also a lot of data where a lot of really good horses on the track have produced really good racehorses as well. Right. And so, you know, it's and and sometimes it's not the immediate generation, but it may be, you know, just like human genetics. Right. Like you can have two parents that were great athletes. Right. And maybe their kids aren't great athletes, but their grandkids are. Uh, you know, so there's things that are going on there that I don't think we all fully kind of understand. You can have a stallion that doesn't really, you know, isn't really prominent as a stallion, you know, but then all of a sudden emerges as a really prominent broodmare stallion. Right. Right. And so there's, there's a lot going on there. And the, the, the one problem I have with the current nicking tools that are used out there today is that they all assume that 50% of the genetics come from the mother and the father. And, and we know that that's just not right. I mean, Puka is a really good example. I mean, Puka was an accomplished horse on the track. Right. And, uh, and um, uh, you know, I bought Puka and Queen Caroline. I didn't know that they actually finished first and second in a race against each other. Right. Okay. And so then they're, then they're in the paddock together. They're having their babies together. But Puka's done something that nobody's done before. I mean, she's got Mage who won the right. Kentucky Derby. She's got Doorknock in the All Derby right. right now. And so, you know, and then we just had a full sibling, you know, um, and, um, you know, but there's something special going on there. So I think you got to get in and I think there's some, there, you know, the, the horse genome has been mapped. And so I think there's, you know, we can't, I'm not trying to nail down and like, you know, scientifically engineer, but I want to understand like what's going on, how much of Puka, uh, is DNA is, is in mage and in door knock and how much of it is good magic, you know, and understanding cause some mares can improve stallions, some, you know, and, and some can't, right. And so right. understanding that I think helps to get like to that optimal, you know, situation from a breeding standpoint. Uh, but again, those are, those are kind of high class problems. I think the first problem is just getting so that you have those good solid pedigrees on the top and the bottom. And I've already gone global, you know, in acquiring those, I went to, you know, Coolmore in Ireland and brought, you know, full four uh, really good uh, thick pedigreed mares back to Kentucky. I just purchased a mare from Japan uh, that's coming back to Kentucky. I've been to Australia, you know, and down there, I'm actually got another one. I can't announce yet from another uh, continent, uh, that we're bringing, uh, uh, mares back to Kentucky. So, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of research and, and understanding and, and then trying to bring the population back here, but there's a lot of work to be done around that. Uh, and I think it's going to be interesting just to see how it plays out. Yeah. You, you know, interesting, you know, if, if Dornock manages to win the Derby, okay. Um, I don't know what exactly that does to the value of Puka, but it certainly raises it exponentially. But but here's the thing. There are certain records in racing that are like never going to be broken. Woody Stevens winning four Belmonts in a row. Nobody ever going to do that. You know what I mean? If if Dornock wins the Derby, that, I, I don't think there's even a remote chance that we ever see that happening again. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That would just be one of those things that just – one time it happened. It's just, it, it, it's never. Well, the number one reason is there's not a lot of people that will breed to the same stallion repetitively until it's right. proven. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's what, that's what makes it so challenging here. Even Puka after door knock was, Puka was, was bred to McKenzie next. Right. Then bred after mage did well was, was, was back to good magic. Good magic. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, now let's let, let's close out with this a little bit more light. You bought Shadwell Farm, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, you tried to buy the Wings Philly. You went to nine million. She went for ten. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
when you get into that kind of money and those kind of negotiations, for the people that don't know, and, and the reason I say this is, first Ferrari I ever bought, okay, when they told me I had to pay extra for the floor mats, I wanted to slap the guy. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, yeah. I expect that with a Toyota. You know what yeah. I mean? You know, mm-hmm. used, to be, used to be mats came with every car. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, you know, years ago, also, that was like a new thing. But when it happened, I was like, what? Floor mats, I got to pay you extra to put mats in the car that are laying in the trunk? What is it like when you are negotiating and, and, and buying at that level? Is it still in, in, in those businesses like I found it is nickel and diamond no matter where? It's just all relative, whether it's a, whether, whether it's a Fiat or a Ferrari, they, you know, nickel and diamond. Or at that level, is it a little different? Um, I think it's uh, I think it's probably a little different. Um, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, w- once you kind of get to a certain level, you know, then um, you get opportunities. You know, they you say, you know, it takes money to make money. Right. And, you know, once you get to a certain level, you can understand what that means. It is, right. you know, you get more access. It's, you know, like, for example, like, you know, the, the number of horses that came uh, to us, you know, to be purchased just based on the, the, the kind of notoriety over the wings Philly thing, you know, is like pretty, pretty tremendous, uh, you know, horses that were not for sale and then all of a sudden were. And so, um, you know, in, but in the wings Philly situation, just, you know, so everybody understands, first of all, I was in Australia and I met the Debbie that, that bought the horse and she wouldn't confirm to me whether she was going to buy the horse or not, or I wouldn't have bid against her. Uh, she told me she wasn't going to bid and she told the press that she wasn't a buyer for the horse. And I was just concerned that, you know, Winks was such a, you know, a substantial horse in Australia that if, if, if she got purchased, for example, by the Japanese, they would take her back to Japan. We just never see that bloodline again. It would be, you know, kind of a crime because Winks is having trouble having holes. And right. so, you know, um, for me, it was about doing something in, and making sure that that horse stayed there. Now, Ten million dollars sounds like a lot of money, but you got to remember the exchange rate is like six five cents on the dollar, so it's not really ten dollars at the beginning anyway. But still, six and a half million dollars is a lot, and uh, and and you know, but I I wasn't going into it blind, you know. Um, once I kind of just made the comment, I and if you look, my first comment was that I would be willing to step in to keep the wings Philly in Australia if it needed to happen. That was just right. my first comment. At that point, I got approached by two different syndicates, right? And they were they 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 were going to buy twenty five percent each of her racing, uh, and and I was going to be able to retain the breeding, but that was deflecting my costs a lot, right? right? And so it's not like I was just bidding nine million dollars or whatever ten you know for the horse, you right. know I I had like you know I don't really take partners a lot you know on horses, yeah. but in this situation because it was like you know look and there's not that Winx Philly's a great horse. But, you know, on just a horse value, if you take all the hype around it, you know, she's a, you know, million and a half, $2 million horse, not not a nine or $10 million horse. I mean, right. it's hard for any yearling to be worth nine or $10 million, you know, yeah. and I, and that's not an insult to her. I'm not trying to, I don't know. I understand. Yeah, mad. Yeah. I'm just saying, yeah. so th- there was a, a part of it for that. And then, you know, the other thing I am, I'm just entering the sport. So I'm also, I'm not, a, I'm not a dumb guy. So I'm thinking about like building my brand. Right. And so when you look at like the when you look at like what the um, uh, notoriety and the uh, publicity that I've gotten out of that uh, situation, you know, and so like people are, oh, you're disappointed. You know, you've been up to nine million, didn't get her. I'm like, I'm the happiest guy ever because I, you know, I right. got to be, you you know, reap and, benefit and you didn't have to spend and, the and money. We put the thing on the international stage. All of a sudden yeah. people were watching it a lot more up here, you know. And, and then it introduced people down there to here. So we got all of that kind of like mix going on in there and everything. And there's, you know, some of this, some, some good, um, um, you know, press for everybody. And people were talking about that and they weren't talking about the problems for a little bit. They were talking about the excitement of that and, you know, it created an exciting moment for the sport in Australia. And, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I played a part in that. Uh, Absolutely. If I, I didn't bid $9 million without the intent of owning the horse. But once I, I had people there that were telling me who the, the bidders were and the Japanese dropped out at six million. And then, you know, it was kind of it, it kind of went fast after that, if you rewatch it. And so uh-huh. once I found out that it was Debbie that had it at 10, I stopped. That's where I said, no, I'm done. And right. so, 
uh, you know, we live streamed it. You can see I kind of did this because one of my guys told me it was her. And I was like, nope, I'm out because I didn't want to run her up. That's what I, not my goal. Right. I know. No, I understand. Um, now, first Saturday in May, um, first derby for you? It's first with, with the corner. horse in it. Right. Yeah. With the horse in it. Yeah. Um, how bad do you want to beat Mike? You know, look, at, you know, if you're, this is, come on, you're competitive. There's yeah, a no, look, I, I'm competitive. At, uh, you know, I've already beat Mike, you know, in the Here Comes the Bride. My horse beat his right at the wire. Uh, right. he, did, he didn't know that, but I, I did. And then uh, there's a couple other races where my horses have beat, beaten his. They, you know, they didn't win, but they, they did better than his. Uh, and so, you know, but look, I, I it's, of course, it would be great, you know, you know, right. to, you know, in all that situation. Fierceness is a really nice horse, you know, uh, and, you know, seems to be freak. Um, Sierra Leone is, you know, when you watch how much ground Sierra Leone covered, you know, coming around that turn, he, he was picking up 30% more ground than everybody. And, and when Flo came after the race, because we had dinner with Sheikh Fah and everybody at my house, and uh, Florian Giroux was telling us, he's like, when I came around the turn, you know, I thought I'd created enough separation that we wouldn't get caught, right? And so it wasn't like he went all out, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, and it's only our third race. It's only that horse's third race, Just a Touch. So, yeah. you know, I, I think, you know, Just a Touch is going to be good. You know, door knock came in fourth. People are discounting them. But sometimes that's good for a horse. You know, to like not, you know, not not being the top three, you know, going into the Derby because then it, it kind of gives everybody a little something to prove there. So I think it's going to be an exciting race. And, you know, I think the real, you know, I'm a winner already. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a guy that was on the other side of the rail. And now I'm talking to you about, you know, things that are going on in the sport. Like every every bad day is a good day. You know, I got people slamming me going, oh, you went 0 for 3 this weekend. I'm like, what are you talking about? I got a second place <laughs> and a third place in great nice. stakes races. You know, like, you know, that, you know, like, it's not, you know, like when we need a podium, that's one of the things we need. We don't need a winner circle. We need a podium. Like right? Formula because, One. Right. Yeah, yeah, like Formula One. So you recognize first, second, third. Those are all accomplishments, you right. know, uh, when you do that. But, you know, everybody wants to focus on first. I get it. And I want first place, you know, but just to second, be in the Derby. Second place is the first loser. That's what they yeah, say. Just, just, just to be in the Derby is, is like a, is like a huge thing. It's the 150th running. So like, you know, I'm, I'm very happy. I hope number one, the horse comes out of it. My, my number one thing is that the horse and the jockey come out of it safely. You know, I hope we put on a, a good run and the horse is able to demonstrate his abilities. You know, he's a very talented horse, but he's only, it's only his fourth race. Right. So, you know, it, it's, it's really early. He doesn't have as much experience as the other horses. Um, yeah, but, but yeah. In, his, in his defense, in his defense, John, you, you know, the trend over the past, you know, decade or so is, Lightly raised horses seem to do a lot better in the Derby than they did. You know, you used to need a lot of bottom and a lot of seasoning. And, you know, that seems to have changed with the way we train and the way yeah. we race now. Lightly raised horses tend to do okay. I, I wouldn't be discouraged by that. Yeah. No, no, no. I, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty high on, on him, uh, you know. And, you know, like I said, but I, I'll recognize that Fierceness is a good horse and, uh, you know, has done well. I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, again, that's the athlete, you know. And, uh, yeah. you know, and, and that athlete has done, has done well and should be, should be respected. There's a lot of other people that want to say, well, the Florida Derby didn't have any competition. And well, it's not fierceness's fault. You know, right. uh, he went down there and he did what he had to do. He won, you know, and I thought it was an impressive, you know, victory. I think it's going to be exciting. I hope everybody's excited about the Derby, uh, and about the activities. And, you know, again, I, I, I you know, I want to try to focus on like, you know, what we're doing on our team and, you know, being positive, you know, you know, we're, we're just, you know, I'm just happy to be a part of it. I'm happy to, uh, you know, to be uh, contributing. And at the end of the day, you know, whether, whether some people think I'm going to flame out in six months, which not going to happen, you know, people, people in Kentucky that know me, they know that that's not going to happen. Like I don't, I, I started on this factory floor making $10 an hour, putting bumpers on cars on the night shift. And now I own a private equity firm with almost $4 billion of assets under management. I'm not the kind of person that like, lets you know, people try to tell me, you know, what, what is going to be successful and what not going to be successful. So I have my own definition of that. And I'm, you know, you, you, you know, anybody that has any kind of success in life has to be pretty determined. And so, you know, I'm, I'm this isn't my daddy's money. Like, you know, I didn't inherit all this money and I'm playing around with horses, you right. know, uh, this is, this is my money, my hard earned money. And, you know, and, and I have, I have some, you know, I've got partners like Sheikh Fahad on, on the, the horse at just a touch and, you know, things like that. But, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'm determined to make this, you know, a successful endeavor.
you know, I'm, 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 I'm glad you said that. Let's close with this and something on a, on a, on a, on a really positive note for everybody. Okay. Um, self-made guy started working, you, you know, $10 a, uh, an hour on a on a night shift, you know, and now you 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 know you're in a position that most people you, you, you know would, would I would certainly respect and a lot of people would envy. Um, and I don't mean envy in a bad way. I mean just you know envy. What would you say to people? Um, is 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 a major key in life and to be successful in life and to achieve goals that are greater. Than you ever expected. I asked you at the beginning of the show, did you ever envision yourself, you know, being in this position? And you, and you said no. So what, what, what could you tell people that, you know, listen, this is really what you got to do. This is what you got to get your arms around to have that chance to get to that level that you don't even think you might get to. Yeah, I think the number one thing I would say is like, uh, you got to believe in yourself. And you got to be willing to take a bet on yourself. A lot of people have opportunity and they don't seize the opportunity and, and because they're scared and, and rightfully so, you know, I worked for another private equity firm for 10 years and I was making good money. And then we decided to leave, start our own firm. And, you know, you go from, you know, making good money to nothing. And I had people tell me the name of my firm was stupid. I had people tell me that John, you don't have a finance degree. Nobody's going to give you money. And then, as I started to raise money, you know, I, I took 350 meetings with investors to get 22 people to say yes. Right. That's the kind of person that people are dealing with here. 330 people told me no, but I didn't let any, I didn't focus on any of those people. That's not what deterred me. I was focused on, you know, myself, I had confidence in myself. And, and then I got the 22 yeses I needed to put myself in business. Now my firm, we have, you know, three offices around the world and, you know, hundred plus employees, we own 180 factories, you know, but if I would have like listened to the, maybe the first hundred meetings where people told me no, and you know, everybody was telling me that you're, no one's going to do this or no one's going to get it for you. I wouldn't be where I am today, but I didn't listen to what everybody else had to say. I, I, I thought I had a good idea. I believed in myself. I believed in my partners. I believed in my team. And, you know, like people telling me no doesn't discourage me. People telling me I'm going to flame out that it motivates me. It doesn't it doesn't uh, it doesn't discourage me at all. Yeah, right. Uh, and, and I understand that I would be the same way. The more people that say you can't, the more kind of kind of kind of makes you want to do it. John, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. You're a gentleman. You came on my show. We, we, we don't really know each other. We met, you, you know, we met here. I respect you for that. I appreciate it. I wish you the absolute best, not only on the first Saturday in May, but in all your endeavors in life, especially those in horse racing, because it's a passion that we both share. Uh, you've certainly, you, you know, made a big splash in the pool. Everybody knows who you are. Um, everybody's watching you. And uh, I hope I hope you do yourself and the sport and, and, and everybody proud and, you know, win, win, win a lot of races and breed a lot of nice horses. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. I'll shut this off real quick and we'll say quick goodbye off camera. All right. It is not free. You have to pay attention to pass the wire TV. Nobody does it better. You don't break your maiden first time out. That way, if you can't run, we'll take a look at him and see if, if he looks in his first start at a mile as professional or more professional than Dornuch did. I think this was to sit off a couple of horses, sit in that stalking spot, like you said, that second flight and make a run. Uh, and I think he's got a lot of room, a lot of room to develop. Hasn't missed a workout either. Like. I think he's I think he's sitting on uh, a huge race and anywhere near four to one um, I'm I'm all in on Sierra Leone any move forward puts him square in, in this race and uh, catching freedom for Brad Cox was was my top choice here uh, so I think this race is gonna set up very similarly to the risen star uh, except I think Catching Freedom will be the one storming late down the center of the track. We should be looking for ways to, to beat the favorite in, in a large field. I think resilience has been running against 
the, the top end of Derby contenders. I am on the one uh, resilience as my top choice. I'm gonna use him my exactus, and by default, because if he really improves, I have to use him on my multi-race wager. It's the 11 society name. Chad Brown gets him ready, and he's, I mean, he's no slouch when it comes to a trainer as it is. For sure. All right, so Sierra Leone for me, Sierra Leone for you. Just kind of always been around it. Uh, Antonio Fresu is uh, an excellent rider. I'm on Stronghold in the Santa Anita Derby. special winners by any sire. On the backstretch, Metoli and Omaha Beach close the gap with stakes performers from coast to coast. Vino Rosso finds his best and leads on the turn with four grade one Colts on dirt. But it's Metoli with his third TDM rising star. Your champion freshman leading an impressive Spendthrift Superfecta. With new DRF All Access Pass Performances. With one best in class product, you now get all three pass performance formats. Go to drf.com and use coupon code one free PP for a free single card today. Mini, a top 10 first crop sire in 2023, standing at McMahon of Saratoga. 14 first crop winners, including My Shady Lady, My winner Shady of the $500,000 New York Stallion Series 5th Avenue Stakes. Grade 2 winner, Winstock, and Stakes winner, Solo Shot, Solo Mini, the 7th leading freshman sire, and the only top 10 freshman sire with a Grade 1 or Grade 2 winner. He sired a $700,000 two-year-old at the OBS April sale. His juveniles sold for nearly six figures on average, more than 12 times the stud fee. Solomini, a controversial DQ from being a grade one winner by two-time horse of the year, Curlin, standing at McMahon of Saratoga Thoroughbreds. Sure Bet Coffee. Put the giddy up in your cup. trips with pick six king john stetton it's one of the best tools in horse racing for any level of player it's your second set of eyes spotting troubled trips betting angles track trends horses to watch and favorites to fade 10 figs ticket structure and more at Tracking Trips, you're a friend with benefits. Not a member? You must hate winning money. Join Tracking Trips now. Visit PassTheWire.com and we'll see you in the winner circle. Remember, nobody does it better.
Fazer Parte.